moving from unsupervised to supervised machine learning. We will use Weka again to apply the k-nearest neighbors algorithm that we saw in the lecture. After that, we will apply another algorithm, decision tree, which we just mentioned in the lecture. Weka lets us switch from one algorithm to another so easily. And of course, we will compare the results of the two algorithms. We will go back to the HCC dataset, but this time we will choose the classify page representing classification algorithms and supervised machine learning in general. We would like to choose KNN as the classifier. We will find it under the lazy folder. Here in Weka, it is called IBK, which stands for instance base, another name for K nearest neighbors. We choose IBK and we will press the hidden button to see all the parameters and we will notice here under KNN, which is the number of neighbors to use, that the default value is one, which doesn't really make sense for us. We will change it to three and press OK. Another important parameter is what attribute the algorithm will try to predict. Let's use in this example the symptoms attribute. The last parameter we want to change is the test options. Here we will choose use training set. It means that the algorithm will take the entire dataset, the training dataset, each time take out one instance out from the dataset, predict the symptoms attribute according to the algorithm KNN here, and will compare the result to the original value in the symptom attribute for that instance. We will see other options later on. The only thing that keeps us away from running k nearest neighbors is clicking start. Let's look at the results. It begins with just the technical data, like the number of instances and the number of attributes, and what they are. The test mode is evaluate on training data, as we just picked. And here in the summary, we see some statistical information. We see that 122 instances were classified correctly, which stands for about 83%. We can also find some other metrics and statistical correlation information, such as what is the true positive percentage, false positive, precision recall, and so on. These represent the ability of the algorithm to correctly predict the symptoms value for each instance. You can also see it here in the confusion matrix, where A stands for 1 for the symptoms value, B for 0, and each column shows how they were classified. So 82 instances that were 1 in symptoms were indeed classified as A, as should be, but 12 were classified as B. In other words, if 1 is positive, so 82 were true positive and 12 were false positives and similarly to B. So this is nice, but this is just the statistical information. Many times I'd like to see the classifications themselves. For that, I will go to more options and under output predictions, change the null default to plain text for now. If I run it again now, I can see this table where for each of the instances, I get the actual value for the symptoms attribute and the predicted value for the symptoms attribute. Now, the way Weka shows it is by enumerating all the possible values. Here, the values are 0 and 1, so it's a bit confusing. If it was uh, ABC, it would have been easier, but let's see. The value of 0 for symptoms, meaning no symptoms, is enumerated as 2 the value of 1 in symptoms, so there are symptoms, is enumerated as 1, and missing data is enumerated as 1 as well, although this is arbitrary and ignored. So these are the actual values, and these are the predicted values. If for a certain instance they don't agree, for example here, we will get a plus sign in the error column. Otherwise, if they agree, or if there is a missing data, we don't get the pluses in the error column. Altogether, they come out to be 
25 incorrectly classified instances. So okay, this is very nice. K-nearest neighbors is indeed a very simple algorithm, but in the lecture we mentioned a very serious problem that it has. It's a kind of a black box algorithm. We see the classifications, the predictions for each patient, that's all good. But so far, the machine learning did not infer a rule or a model for classification, if you will. Now, what's so nice about this Weka platform is that with a click of a button, you can find so many other classification algorithms. Do you remember I mentioned decision trees? Let's see what it's all about. Under classifier, I will open the trees folder. There are several algorithms here, which the most basic one is J48. The only thing that keeps me away from learning the decision tree is clicking start. And hey, I got 97%. I'm so happy. Well, I hope it will last. For now, let's see the tree. I will right click on this run and select Visualize Tree. I will enlarge this window, right click here and select Fit to Screen. Nice! So here I see a tree that as physicians probably looks very familiar, like the sort of algorithms physicians use to decide on diagnosis, treatment and so on. But in this case, it was learned automatically from the data. The tree is constructed from nodes. These are all those circles with names of attributes. Edges that split all the records of the patients in this node into groups. So for example, PS has five different values where all the patients fall into. Other attributes can be binary, like 0 and 1 for gender, female and male. And for numeric values, like MCV, the algorithm finds a threshold, a cutoff, which is a good separator. In addition to the nodes and the edges, a tree has also leaves. Leaves are actually nodes that are homogeneous enough, so the algorithm decided not to split them by more edges into more nodes. Okay, that's nice. But by looking at this tree, how can we be confident that it's not just a matter of coincidence? Or in other words, taking into account that there's also noise in the data, there are always outliers, can we be sure that they did not affect our model? That they did not overfit the noise? Okay, hey, we are scientists. So a very basic principle in science is having a control group. This is exactly what we do in data science. We want to see that if we split the data set into two groups, we will learn the tree from one group and test the predictions in a dental group. I'll show you what I mean. Here is how I'm going to do it. I'm coming back to the package we downloaded from Kaggle, where we have this uh, HCC data file from the ARFF type, which contains the data set. I will split this file into two parts, training set and test set. Notice that there are other ways to make a test set, which we will see in a few minutes, but I want you to have this capability as well. Very simply, I will duplicate this file with a simple copy-paste operation. Copy and paste and paste again. Now let's call this one HCC Data Training and this one HCC data test. Okay, we will use a text editor to open both files uh, simultaneously. I'm actually using a very nice text editor called uh, Notepad++, but you can use any other kind of uh, text editor or just Notepad. I'm opening the training set. Good. And in parallel, I'm going to open the test set. Okay, so if you remember, this file begins with uh, a few lines of comments. And then we have the name of the dataset and the attributes. And here is all the data. So for a moment, I'm going just to delete everything. Oh. And now I'm going to go to the training file.
and randomly pick a block of few instances, let's say 50 out of the 165 instances. So we will take from, let's say, 201 to 250, like this. I will cut them out and paste them in the test set file. Voila! Now I took the dataset that I had and split it between two files in the way that I wanted it to be. So here is the test set and here is the training set. I'll save them both and go back to Weka. Here in Weka, I will close this tree visualization and I will have to reload the data because this time it's a different file, it's just a training set. Here it is. Notice that now I have only 115 instances. I will go back to the classify page and under test options, change it to supply test set. And here I will supply it. This is the test file. And I will need also to state what attribute I want to predict. So it will be the symptoms again. Okay. Since I loaded a new file, I will need to do the same here. Pick the class that I want to predict, symptoms. And now just press start again. Oh, what an unpleasant surprise. Here I got only 71%. If I compare it to what I had before, then I had 97%. Let's visualize this tree. We can see that it's really different. Well, believe it or not, this is actually a good thing. Probably the 71% success rate is much more authentic, much more reliable than what I had before. This is simply because now when the data is separated into two groups into two sets and they learn the rule from one set and quantify how good it is with a different set it resembles much of the actual scenario in practice but more than that you see if there is no limitation on the tree depth in many cases the tree can be constructed with many branches maybe too many so that almost every instance will have a leaf of its own this is what we have in this tree if we use such a tree to test how each of the instances that constructed the tree gets classified, it's obvious that we will receive high success rate. This will not be the case here, when we construct a tree on one dataset and test it on another. This problem, this phenomenon, is called overfitting. So, supplying a different test set is a good and very fundamental technique. As a matter of fact, this technique is so common that Weka can do it automatically. So you may ask, why did I show you this, the manual separation into two files? As I said before, this is a capability I want you to have anyway, both because sometimes we need to control the way we differentiate between training and test, and also because this kind of manual work is required for many other purposes. But how do I do it automatically? I will reload the original file. Again, I will do it by magic. Here I had 115 instances and now we are back to 165. I will go back to classify and pick percentage split. The default says that I will use two thirds of my data set as a training set and the other third as a test set. Let's not forget to change the class back to symptoms just because I reloaded the file. I run it again, and here I receive 51%, very far away from the original 98%, and also worse than the selection I did manually. Weka, of course, does it randomly, which represents a more realistic scenario. But hey, if this is done randomly, maybe the random seed influences the results. 
I can change the seed here, more options, and change it from one, let's say, to two. Okay, test it again, 39%. That's really bad. Let's change it again. Sixty-four percent. So what do I learn from that? I said this is a good method, but as we can see, it's not reliable. It is so much dependent on the random seed. Well, it is dependent on the random seed because of a very common problem. I don't have enough data. So taking just two thirds of it result in a tree that does not represent the true biological mechanism. It just represents coincidence because each time I picked different instances for the training set. Luckily enough, another basic and commonly used method is cross-validation. This method is good anyway, but especially good when the size of my dataset is too small compared to its complexity. This method splits the data into a few subgroups randomly. The number of subgroups appear here. Let's make it five. So each subgroup actually comprises 20% of the original dataset. However, it will repeat it five times. So it's a nice way to assess the true quality of my model with less dependency on the random seed. I'll run it again. I got 68%. Good. As you can see, the random seed doesn't change much, the results. Nice. There are, of course, many other supervised machine learning algorithms, and you can very easily learn about them, play, and apply them with the Weka platform. Have a try. It's fun. Next, we will learn another interesting discipline artificial intelligence and its applications in medicine. Wow.